We are thrilled today to have um, a, a favorite of mine, Dr. Natalie Marshall, um, who will be joining us. She'll be talking about exercise and cancer, the impact of physical activity. And so before I introduce her, I just want us to again take a moment like we did last time to think of what, who, question, uh, what's bringing you to us today and keep that in mind as you listen in to her talk um, and ask questions um, uh, of her. So Natalie Marshall, if you'll come on, um, she is a fantastic medical oncologist with an interest in breast cancer. She's an assistant professor of medicine at UCSF. She works at Mission Bay and uh, at the UCSF Cancer Center in Berkeley. She completed her medical oncology fellowship at Yale New Haven Hospital uh, and has been practicing oncology for 25 years. She completed the faculty scholars program at the Osher Center for Integrative Medicine in July of this past year, 2021. She is very interested in improving metabolic health and promoting lifestyle modifications to reduce cancer risk and the risk of uh, cancer returning. And a little known fact is that she is a jazz singer, um, and we may have to come back to that in the Q&A, uh, but that obviously brings her a lot of joy and brings us a lot of joy as well. She's also a master's division Olympic weightlifter, um, and that is a kind of weightlifting which increases muscle mass, and she's, I'm sure, happy to answer questions about that as well. And she is developing training programs and an exercise oncology program for patients at UCSF and piloting some really interesting work in neuro-oncology and at the Berkeley Outpatient Center. So without further ado, thank you for joining us, Dr. Marshall, and the floor is yours. I want to talk about physical activity and its impact with um, cancer because it's one of the things that can help anybody that has cancer, regardless of what type of cancer they have. And it also uh, can help prevent cancer. And that's, that's a, another thing that I really want to drive home tonight is prevention of cancer. So now you can read the learning objectives, um, talking about prevention, uh, specific benefits in cancer patients. I want to talk about uh, body composition um, and its relationship to cancer. And then try to help people broaden their view of exercise. It doesn't have to be like a gym and to make a plan to get started or increase exercise. So um, I just wanna talk about just some history of exercise and the recognition of exercise for health. Um, an Indian physician in 600 BC named Shush Shushrita was the first person that has been documented to prescribe exercise for health. Um, he referred patients to exercise because it made the body stout, strong, firm, compact, and light enhanced the growth of limbs and muscles, improved digestion and complexion, and prevented laziness and reduced senility. And it's very fascinating to me that in 600 BC, he would note all of these things because these are the things that in modern medicine we, we know to be true. Hippocrates um, also, who, who is really called the father of modern medicine, said that eating alone will not keep a man well, he must also take exercise. So going on through time, we're gonna fast forward to the early 1900s when some physicians noted that the poor did not develop cancer. It tended to victimize the wealthy individuals. And when he was noting this, he was noting that wealthy individuals had food and poor individuals did not in the early 1900s. And so, um, wealthy individuals who tended to be overweight were noted to have more cancer. And we, we kind of think about that as energy balance, like how much food you can take in and how much movement you do. We, we tend to think of that as energy balance. Um, and then there's a, an, a, another group of physicians that noted in 1921 that human carcinoma may be the reaction to and result of chronic irritation of adult epithelial tissue, which means the surface of the cells in the body, bathed in body fluids altered by certain metabolic products as a result of deficient muscular activity. So this was the kind of a, 
a way of noting that if, if a person didn't exercise, maybe their cells were in a bad environment, what we, what we call now the tumor microenvironment. And then the last historical observation that I just want to um, talk about is um, a, a person, F.L. Hoffman, he was a physician in 1937, who did a clinical trial. It was like a retrospective study of 4,000 people. And they were given a lengthy questionnaire and 22, 34 patients with cancer, 1149 without. And he, his conclusion from this lengthy questionnaire was that excess nutrition demanded an outlet in physical activity, which is rarely met in modern life. And this was also a time when there was um, mechanization happening. Um, so people had less physical uh, labor that they did. Hoffman felt that the latent power of growth and development likely found an outlet in cell proliferation. So translated, he thought that this excess nutrition without a, a way to um, use the nutrition through exercise or, or physical work um, helped cells grow and develop into cancer. So I'm just going to talk, I'm, you can look at this later at your leisure, but it, these are like all the health benefits of regular physical activity. And you might note in here that it decreases cardiovascular risk. It decreases your risk of dying of any cause. It decreases the risk of certain cancers. There's pretty strong evidence for these cancers. Improves your cognition and ability to think and, and reduces the risk of dementia. But then a, a lot of other things um, are also helped by exercise, like anxiety, depression, help, help with sleep. So there's a lot of, of benefits of exercise. And there are also benefits of exercise in older people because it helps people not fall down and break a hip. And so it's, it decreases the risk of injuries. So primary cancer prevention. Um, one in three patients in the United States are, is going to be diagnosed with cancer. And what are the ways that we can prevent cancer? Um, so I've listed the, the things that we know could prevent cancer. So avoiding tobacco and alcohol. And alcohol is something that people might not know about, but alcohol does increase your risk of cancer, certain types of cancer, um, especially if you drink um, for women over one per day or for men over two per day. Maintaining a healthy body weight decreases the risk of cancer, eating a healthy diet, getting vaccinated for viruses that cause cancer like hepatitis B or human papilloma virus, wearing sunscreen, that's a pretty simple one to decrease the risk of skin cancer. And then something that I think a lot of people don't know is that engaging in exercise decreases the risk of cancer. So we're going to focus on that today. So I just want to go over a few things about just sedentary behavior. Um, so sedentary behavior, um, this, is a, this is a study that was looking at um, risk of dying and um, activity. And it wasn't a cancer population, but it's just looking at your risk of dying. And if you, the way you read these, these graphs, the line down the middle here is no effect. Like if, if everything's on this, this line, it means there's no effect. If it's above, it's an increased risk. And if it's below the line, it's a decreased risk. So what they did was looked at people who every hour did some activity, like maybe they got up and walked for one minute every hour or two minutes every hour, three minutes, four minutes, five minutes. But these were looking at very small amounts of activity done in an hour long, after an hour long of sitting. And what they found is that even as little as two minutes of activity, people would have a better overall survival. So if you look at this area right here, this is the two minute mark. If you did light activity for two minutes, it reduced the risk of dying by, by about um, 33%. And the more activity you did, the lower the risk of dying. So sitting is the new smoking. People have probably heard that. And sedentary behavior is second only to smoking 
as the leading preventable cause of cancer in the United States. I think that's a pretty stunning statistic because I don't think people think about sitting or being sedentary as a cancer risk. Um, and this graph is from the Physical Activity Guidelines for Americans. And what it shows is that in the red here, the risk of dying, all-cause mortality, if you sit and you don't do any activity. So this line on this bottom is doing activity. So this man, you can see he's walking. So this is doing none, and then this is increasing your activity. And this is the daily sitting time going from none to sitting a lot. And if you're in the red, you're kind of in trouble. And if you're in the green, you're getting out of trouble because this is a lower mortality rate. So in the red, all going towards the green, going towards the green is better. So if you sit a lot, but then you exercise a lot, you have to exercise quite a bit, then you can actually move over here into the green. If you don't sit very much and you exercise a lot, you're in the green quite a bit of the time. So this is just a, a kind of a visual way of looking at the more activity that you can do, the lower your risk of dying. Now let's talk about sedentary behavior, why I'm bringing this up. It's because sedentary behavior has an increased risk, not just of all cause mortality, but of specific cancers can be increased, the risk of can be increased by sedentary behavior. So breast cancer, colon cancer, and endometrial cancer have very strong evidence that uh, sedentary behavior increases the risk. And this is also, um, this is also a graph that I really like to show people because it also is looking at the relationship of exercise to all-cause mortality, and it's looking at it in a different kind of way. This bottom area on the graph is looking at leisure time physical activity. So doing activities such as walking or riding a bike, or, or it doesn't have to be strenuous activity, just leisure time activity and looking at the risk of mortality. And what it shows is that there's a very early steep slope going where your risk is going down. And this is like people that go from doing nothing to a little bit of exercise, not even a lot of exercise, but just a little bit of exercise. They really drop their risk of, of dying. And that's about a 20% risk reduction in that first steep curve. So they've done studies looking at the, uh, what, what amount of exercise is needed for people. And this, um, this graph kind of shows that the sweet spot where you get a, a big reduction of risk and then after that sweet spot doesn't go down very much. So doing extra exercise doesn't necessarily benefit you. Um, it's really between 150 to 300 minutes of moderate physical activity per week. I'm gonna go over what that means later in the talk, but moderate activity is when you can talk, but you can't sing. So when you could, you know, sorry, where you, where you can talk, but you can't sing is moderate activity. And then if you can't talk at all, that would be intense activity. So this is also a study from the same um, paper that showed that for all of these different types of cancer listed here on the left, that if you exercise of that, at that 150 minutes a week, that same amount that they kind of studied, that the risk of getting these types of cancer was reduced. Again, this is one of those plots where the, the line down the middle here is no effect. If it's to the left, it's protective and a decreased risk. And if it's to the right, it's an increased risk. So the one cancer that they really saw an increased risk of leisure time activity was with melanoma. And that's because when people are exercising outside, they might have more sun exposure. So they think that the melanoma risk is increased just from extra sun exposure. So the moral to that story is to wear sunscreen and go out and exercise. Um, but all of these different cancers were, the risk was decreased by exercising at that moderate activity, 150 minutes per week. So exercise for cancer prevention the tumors with the strongest evidence are the, the following ones that I've listed. 
And these are some of the most common cancers in people. So colon cancer and breast cancer are very common. Um, bladder cancer and endometrial cancer are very common. Um, so it's, these are common cancers that if you exercise, you would decrease your risk of getting them. And then there's another thing that's really important and that's for cancer survivors, um, exercising can decrease the risk in breast cancer, colon cancer, and prostate cancer. I'm gonna repeat that in a little bit when I talk about cancer populations. But if you're trying to prevent yourself from getting cancer, this is something that is very strong evidence that if you exercise, you would decrease your risk. These are the specific recommendations for minimum exercise dose for cancer prevention. And the first, the first is to limit sedentary behavior. So if you're sitting a lot to get up and do some activity, two minutes, three minutes, five minutes, whatever, whatever you can do, do some activity um, every hour. Um, I'm gonna go over something called exercise snacks later, but instead of like getting up and going to the kitchen, you could do, you could take an exercise snack instead. That's the way I kind of like to look at it. So sometimes when I'm working, I'll just, I'll just do some kind of little exercise, three sets of 10 or some push-ups or something like that. That's what I call exercise snacks. So limiting sedentary behavior could be also a walk, a little walk, going outside for five minutes to take a walk or doing something at home. Engaging in at least 150 minutes a week of moderate exercise or 75 minutes a week of intense exercise. Um, and then the other part is engaging in strength training exercise for all the major muscle groups at least twice a week. And we're gonna go over how to do that at length. So how does exercise help patients who actually have cancer? Um, it enhances immune system function. It lowers inflammation in the body. When you get cancer treatments, uh, some of the side effects are caused by inflammation. Well, exercise lowers inflammation, so that can help with side effects. Um, when you exercise, it lowers your stress hormones. It lowers your stress level. Um, it changes the microbiome. And um, Dr. Mishra um, mentioned the microbiome and how sometimes uh, the microbiome uh, can be uh, involved in whether you respond to immune therapy or not. So when you exercise, it actually changes the microbiome in a very favorable way. Um, it lowers estrogen levels by decreasing body fat. It improves body composition. And that means that it helps you have more muscle to the fat that you have, you have more muscle or building more muscle so that your ratio of muscle to fat is better. It improves cardiac function and heart and lung function. And a very important one is that exercise in cancer patients can help with cognitive dysfunction or brain fog that people complain about sometimes with treatment. Um, exercise can improve cognition and brain function. This is the, the the parts of, these are, these are the different uh, ways in which exercise can help that has the strongest evidence in multiple clinical trials. Um, one that I'm gonna mention in a minute is cancer-related fatigue. This is a very big problem in cancer patients um, and cancer-related fatigue is the thing that is most helped by exercise. Um, Health-related quality of life. So ability to do the things that are important to you and to feel better physically. There are different ways that people measure quality of life in these studies, but health-related quality of life was improved by exercise. Physical function, just like how your body's working, how your body's functioning, anxiety, depression, and lymphedema. Now, lymphedema is something that a lot of people don't know about that um, weightlifting and strength training can actually help improve lymphedema and prevent lymphedema. So at the bottom here, when you're getting your materials from this talk, there is an, uh, there's another uh, thing that you can go to on the web and it has more information about other things that exercise does in cancer patients. This is um, from this 
a website called Moving Through Cancer, which I'm going to give you uh, some information about and some resources at the end of the talk. But this is a summary of all the different things that, that can help a patient with cancer related to exercise. And it also breaks it down into um, aerobic exercise or resistance exercise and which type of exercise helps what thing. So for instance, lymphedema is really helped by resistance training, but anxiety is really helped by aerobic activity. Bone health and preserving bone density is helped by resistance training. Um, and cancer-related fatigue um, and depression are helped by both. So you, you can see from this graph, like which type of exercise would help which problem and what has evidence for that in, in many different types of clinical trials. This has also been shown across all types of cancer. It's not just breast cancer patients or colon cancer patients, but it includes patients that of all different types of cancer. Um, it also uh, it has been studied in patients with lymphoma and leukemia and some of the blood tumors as well. This is survival and physical activity. And if in all the sites of cancer, if a person was diagnosed with cancer and they were, they were exercising prior to the diagnosis, what, this, what these studies have shown is that for all sites, if you had exercise, if you were exercising prior to the diagnosis, you had a better overall survival. And the post-diagnosis setting, after a diagnosis is, has been made and then you started exercising afterwards, in those three that I mentioned earlier, breast, colon, and prostate cancer, there was a lower risk of recurrence. So let's talk about cancer-related fatigue. Cancer-related fatigue can be very disabling for patients. It's distinguished from regular fatigue. Uh, it's a, a complex multifactorial syndrome. So meaning that it's, there's many different things that are causing it and it's not fully helped by rest. So even if the person sleeps 10 hours a day or 11 hours a day, they still feel fatigued. It's caused by systemic inflammation. It also, um, they think is caused by the hormones that regulate your adrenal gland and your pituitary and your stress hormones, that that system becomes off balance. It can also cause depression. Um, it can be caused by anemia and physical inactivity. And medications are really just not effective for cancer-related fatigue. They have tried using some stimulants for patients like they use in patients with um, ADHD or um, ADD, but they're, they have a lot of side effects um, and they're not super effective in helping people with cancer-related fatigue. So what they've shown in studies is that exercise is the single most effective treatment, more effective than medications. And those with the greatest fatigue at baseline get the greatest effects from exercise. Even very small amounts of exercise can help. So this is a little cartoon that I wanna show you about how, how this inflammation happens and how it affects the body. So when you get cancer treatment, um, what happens is that it can cause destruction of cells. It can cause different chemicals called cytokines to be released. It can make the body feel like there's danger. So when we cut ourselves, like if we just cut our arm, our body senses the danger, it will make a clot, it will send immune cells to the area to help us heal. When you get cancer treatments like radiation or chemotherapy or surgery, doesn't have to always just be chemotherapy, um, what happens is it can cause a lot of inflammation and it can affect the entire body and especially it can affect the brain. All these chemicals that get released can affect the brain and the immune system also is activated, which causes inflammation. So this can cause decreased appetite, decreased energy, like withdrawal socially where you don't wanna be social, sleep changes, impaired learning and memory, 
and then pain, and it can also cause fever. This results in what we call sickness behavior because the patient's feeling sick, but exercise can really help with this. So I wanna talk about uh, epigenetics and people may have heard of what epigenetics is, but epigenetics is the expression of genes um, because of environmental factors. Um, and so it's the interaction of environmental factors with our DNA and our genes. And what happens when um, that, ha that, that happens is that diseases could be manifested or if the environment's interacting with our genes in a way, way that's good, it might suppress the expression of disease. We may not get a disease because of the environmental factors we're choosing that to interact with our DNA. So it's a very positive thing to learn about epigenetics because we are not destined to be sick. Um, food, exercise, sleep, stress, trauma, mental health, toxic exposure, all these things that we can sometimes choose and sometimes just happen to us, they influence if a disease is manifested or not. Um, I don't know who said this, but I really like this quote. It's, it's genes load the gun, but the environment pulls the trigger. And why I'm bringing this up in the middle of my talk is to, to help you understand why exercise is so important and why all of these lectures that you're getting um, in this mini medical school uh, program are important because the food that we eat, which Dr. Donald Abrams will talk about next week, that can interact with our genes and give information to our genes, which could make us healthier or it can make us sicker. Um, exercise can do that. Um, lowering stress through uh, meditation or different forms of stress reduction could interact with our, our genes and also make us healthier. Or if we have excessive stress, it could make us sicker. Let's talk about the tumor microenvironment. So this is the area around a tumor in, your, in the body that the tumor is interacting with. So the cells surrounding and communicating with the tumor cells. And why I wanna show you this is that in the body, the fat cells and the muscle cells do different things. The fat cells can cause inflammation and can cause elevated insulin in the bloodstream. These different chemicals, which you don't have to know all of these different chemicals, but these different chemicals can interact with the tumor and the tumor microenvironment and help a cancer grow. The skeletal muscle or your muscle mass, the muscles we use to exercise, those muscle cells can make chemicals also that can interact with the tumor microenvironment and cause these epigenetic changes that can make a tumor not grow or suppress the ability of the cancer to grow. And that's a, that's a pretty exciting thing to know about because it makes the reason for exercising really different than if it's just because you wanna look good or get into some special genes, right? Exercise can actually help change the environment and make it harder for the tumor to be happy and comfortable and fat cells and a lot of the chemicals that are made by fat cells, including hormones or insulin, those different chemicals can make the cancer feel happy and comfortable and, and can make it more likely to grow. So how does exercise prevent and decrease recurrence in cancer? So I'm, this is like a summary of what, what I was showing you on that cartoon, it lowers insulin, it lowers sex hormones. So specifically in women, it can lower estrogen, but in men also, it lowers inflammation. So adipokines is a big fancy name for the chemicals that the fat cell makes, adipose tissue or adipokines. Myokines are the chemicals that the muscle makes. Those are called myokines. It lowers oxidative stress. It changes that tumor microenvironment. It stimulates the immune system. And that is detectable in the micro tumor microenvironment. When people exercise, you can see 
can you can see immune cells going into the tumor microenvironment to help um, to help it fight the cancer, and then altering the epigenetic expression of genes in the tumor cells. Okay, so this is just a list of what we were looking at at that previous slide. So let's now turn to body composition. Now, people might have heard of body mass index, and that is a measure that we that we we take someone's height and weight, and we, we come up with a number called the body mass index. There's a scale. So if I weigh 160 pounds and I'm five foot seven, I'm going to have a certain BMI. Um, if you're heavier, you oftentimes will have a higher BMI. And they used to use the BMI to correlate with if you're overweight or not. And they still, they still do, but we've, we've learned that it's an imperfect measure of body composition. So what this um, slide is, is a CAT scan slice of a patient. It's like, um, if, if you're in a CAT scan, it kind of slices you like bread and takes pictures like slices of bread. And this is one patient, and this is another patient, and they have the exact same body mass index. And what this shows is that um, there's, their, their body composition is very different, even though they have the same body mass index. They're both having a body mass index of 29. But in this patient on the right, this person has a lot of muscle. The red in the body is muscle. And you can see that they have quite a bit of muscle. The, the yellow is visceral fat. And this is fat that's very inflammatory. Um, so the person has some visceral fat, but not near as much as the person over here. And you can see that this person has a lot less red because they have a lot less muscle mass. So even though they both have a BMI of 29, they have very different body composition. Um, they also um, did some studies that looked at muscle mass and fat mass and looking at Patients with even normal BMIs or even low BMIs can have high fat content and low muscle mass, even if they're not considered overweight. And this is a very bad thing because having low muscle mass is a problem. So in patients who have low muscle mass who get diagnosed with colon cancer, this is a study that showed that about 40% of them had low muscle mass, what we call sarcopenia, at their diagnosis. And they were treated the same as the patients who had normal muscle mass. But what they found is that those patients that had lower muscle mass, the ones with the, the darker line on the bottom, they had a worse survival from their cancer. And that was independent of their treatment, their stage of their cancer, how advanced it was. If they had bad muscle mass, low muscle mass, they had a worse survival. In this, in this graph at the bottom, the patients that had high body fat and low muscle mass, no, no matter what their BMI was, they had the very worst survival. So it's not about how you look and it's not about how much you weigh, it's about how much muscle mass do you have. Um, that's actually a really important thing. So this was also shown in breast cancer patients. So in non-metastatic breast cancer patients. So patients that just got diagnosed with breast cancer, they had a CAT scan, they looked at their muscle mass and they saw that about a third of them had low muscle mass, sarcopenia is the name for that. And they had a worse survival independent of their treatment stage or body mass index. So these two, um, studies, the reason I'm showing them to you is just to show you how important muscle mass is in surviving cancer. So sarcopenia or low muscle mass is common in cancer patients in early disease and late disease. It's common with aging and cancer is a disease of aging. So if you're older, when you get cancer, you might've already lost some muscle mass just because of getting older. And then if you have cancer and low muscle mass, that can be a bad combination. It's an independent predictor of overall mortality in cancer patients. So if you have low muscle mass, 
you're more likely to die if you than if you have mus more muscle mass. Low muscle mass is consistently associated with greater side effects from treatment as well. So the risk factors for sarcopenia in cancer patients are many. It can be from the therapy itself. It can be from the tumor burden. So if I'm a patient that has a large amount of cancer in my body, that cancer needs a lot of energy and it will use a lot of my energy and make me lose weight. And that's called increased catabolism. Um, so sometimes you have low muscle mass because the cancer is just using all the energy up. Malnutrition because of treatment side effects. That's why nutrition is so important for, for cancer patients. So if a person doesn't really take in a lot of protein, they might be losing muscle mass because of that. There's less muscle reserve as we get older. And then this is a big one that can be changed for patients, this inactivity due to side effects caused by lean, causing the loss of the lean muscle mass. So patients that don't exercise during treatment will also lose muscle mass. So the moral to this slide is really that having cancer can be a problem with losing muscle mass because of treatment, malnutrition, not enough protein intake. But the, the important thing is that you can change that by increasing your activity, even if you increase your activity just a little bit. What does muscle do for us? It helps block the abnormal um, chemicals that the fat cells make. These are fat cells down here, and here's our muscle. It makes myokines that block the adipokines or the fat chemicals from, in, from talking with the body. It makes all these good chemicals that help with lowering insulin, helping with muscle gene generation. This one chemical right here, irisin, helps with cognitive function, helps the brain, um, and it helps you use sugar more effectively so that you're less likely to be diabetic. So muscle mass does a lot for us and does a lot for cancer patients. Now, I am a little biased because I am a weightlifter, but um, I want to go over the benefits of strength training, and I hope that I've convinced you by those previous slides that maintaining your muscle mass and building your muscle mass is an important goal with exercise. So the specific benefits of strength training is that it lowers insulin more than any other type of exercise. It increases muscle mass better than any kind of exercise. It decreases lymphedema in breast cancer patients. And it increases strength and mobility. So if you are doing strength training, you're oftentimes increasing the mobility and strength of your muscles and that sur surround your joints. And that can help with mobility. It improves quality of life because you're able to get up out of the chair easily or you're able to do things in your house or in your life that you maybe couldn't do if you didn't have muscle mass. And it lowers the risk of fractures or being placed in a nursing home. So this is a study that they did walk with patients who walked 30 minutes a day, 150 minutes a week of walking 30 minutes a day, five days a week. And they did 40 minutes of strength training per week. So they did two 20 minute sessions of strength training. And they measured all these different chemicals in the body, the leptin, adiponectin, they looked at the weight, weight waist and hip ratio. And they didn't have see very many changes. Um, of these ones. But what they did see was this dramatic drop in insulin. And insulin's a growth factor for, for a lot of different cancers to grow. And just that little bit of strength training and 30 minutes of walking did a very good job of lowering the insulin level. I've mentioned this a couple times about how strength training helps breast cancer patients. Um, but one of the things that they used to tell breast cancer patients is, oh, don't lift weights. You could get a lymphedema. You could really hurt yourself. And that just has been proven to not be true. Strength training is safe in breast cancer patients. And compared to controls, the patients who did resistance training had less lymphedema severity, increased upper body and lower body strength, less exacerbations of lymphedema when it was measured by a certified lymphedema therapist. And there were no complications at all by doing strength training. So what are some other ways you can do strength training? Because um, some people don't want to lift weights. 
Um, I like to always point out that yoga, Tai Chi and Qigong, which a lot of people like to do because they're also meditative, meditative practices. These practices are very complex. They incorporate body weight strength training. They also work on balance and flexibility and they also help with stress reduction. Um, and I like to liken this to a, a whole plant extract versus taking an isolated compound. So if you ate turmeric root, like you grated it up in your smoothie versus if you just take a purified curcumin tablet. So eating like the whole thing um, maybe would be, a, a, it's a more complex and maybe has more benefits. Um, yoga has been studied the most in cancer populations and it has good evidence for lymphedema, strength training, mobility, stress reduction, anxiety, and cancer-related fatigue. There's like a lot of evidence for yoga. And so I like to tell patients if they don't want to lift weights or maybe they, they, don't, they don't feel comfortable lifting weights or doing even body weight strength training, maybe to try one of these gentle practices to get started with some body weight strength training um, and balance training. And then that also can help with flexibility and mobility. It's a really good choice for people who don't want to go to a gym or lift weights. So exercise snacks are something that I, I just love to tell people about. Um, and these were exercise snacks. The whole idea of it was brought up by this woman named Catherine Schmidt, who I have at the end of our talk. Um, she has a book for cancer patients on how to get started with exercise and how to, how to go forward with exercise. Um, but exercise snacks are small strength training or aerobic exercises that you can do throughout the day. So wall push-ups, chair squats, a five minute walk, small amounts of strength training to help you build confidence and to do more. Um, exercise can improve energy. So if someone is really feeling fatigued and they do a little exercise snack, they might actually notice that they feel a lot more energy. And also it can help with motivation and mood, getting you into a victorious cycle. So I want to pause now and we're gonna do some exercise snacks together. Okay, so everybody get into a chair. Okay, we're gonna just do some exercise snacks now. So I wanna start off with chair marching. So why I wanna show you exercise snacks is that even if you're weak, even if you're totally fatigued from your treatment, in a chair, people can still do exercise that can be beneficial. So even if you can't go out for a 30 minute walk, which seems like overwhelming to some patients, you can do some things in the chair. So we're gonna start off with chair marching. And so what we're gonna do is lift our legs up in our chair. If you need to hold onto the side of your chair, you can. And just raise the legs. We're gonna do 20 chair marches. So ready? One, two, three, four five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18, 19, 20. Okay, so you can stop and kind of shake everything out. And um, I'm gonna do another one that's, um, that, that uses your forearms and your hands, muscles that get tight. You know, they get tight from being on the computer, but they can just get tight. And so I'm gonna try to sit back so you can see me better. You're gonna have your hand all the way above your head, arms stretched out, and we're gonna just open and close our hands back and forth. And try to just go as, as quickly as you can back and forth. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen, fourteen, fifteen, sixteen, seventeen, eighteen, nineteen, twenty. 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18, 19, 20. Okay, and shake out your arms. That was one that surprised me in a yoga class that I I'm this big, strong weightlifter, and I was fatigued in my forearms from that. So that's an easy way to strengthen your arms, and that can help you get out of a chair, right? <clears throat> the next one 
that I like to show people in the chair that you can do. This is an exercise um, called chest punches. So similar to if you were lifting weights with a, with a bar and you were doing a bench press where you're pushing your arms out, we're gonna do one arm at a time going forward and then we're gonna cross over. And when you cross over, try to engage your, your core muscles so that when you're crossing over, you're actually activating your core as well. So crossing over or straight. Okay, we're gonna start off with straight and then we're gonna cross over for the last 10. So ready, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12, and now cross over using your core, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. Okay. And now I'm gonna have you sit back in your chair a little bit and you're gonna put your legs out straight. I don't know if you can see my legs. Let me see if I can put this down a little bit more. Put your legs out straight and then circle your ankles, ankle circles. And you're going to go in one direction, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, and then the opposite direction. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. So I don't know how many minutes we just took to do that. But that would be what I would call an exercise snack. And you could have done one of those things, or you could have done four of them. But it takes like two to five minutes and get your blood pumping and get your kind of get you out of the, the zone of, of Zoom. So I'm going to go back to my talk now. Less than 25% of cancer patients are active and patients can feel overwhelmed with the guidelines, I feel like, and sometimes cancer treatment related fatigue is the problem, fear of injury, fear of lymphedema, fear of fractures. You know, in patients that have had bone metastases, I can understand why patients would be fearful of doing exercise. And maybe if you have bone metastases, it wouldn't be a good idea to do something that could be high impact where you could really hit your body. Um, but probably walking is safe. Um, and especially if you walk with someone else. Um, lack of education of the benefits. And I'm hoping I'm going to change that today with my talk. And lack of knowledge of how to get started. So these are the guidelines. And what I tell my patients is these are goals to work towards. It's okay to start small and have these guidelines as a goal. And if you never reach the goal of these guidelines, it's okay. If you go from doing nothing to doing some exercise, even if it's never these goals, it's okay. And that still helps you. It still helps you lower your risk of dying. It lowers your risk of getting cardiovascular disease. It lowers your risk of, uh, you know, having side effects from your cancer if you do anything at all. And this is my talk seeing test that I mentioned earlier, but you want to kind of see what intensity am I working at when I'm doing exercise. So light is that you could sing a song while engaging in the activity. So like singing in the shower is light activity. Um, moderate is you could talk, but you can't sing a song. So these ladies here to the right, they're probably doing moderate activity. They're talking to each other. And then intense activity is you can't carry on a normal conversation. So I don't know about you guys, but when I'm swimming, I can't carry on a conversation. So that would be because I'm breathing really hard. Or if you're running, maybe you're breathing really hard. Or maybe for some people, even if you're walking fast, that you're breathing really hard and that might be really intense for you. So there's this thing called the FIT principle, which is frequency, intensity, time, and type. So frequency is how many days a week are you exercising? The intensity, you measure it by the sing talk test. Um, time, the hours you're going per week, and your, your goal is to get to 150. But if you're not doing any exercise, if you did five minutes a day and you got, you know, 35 minutes per week, that's still a lot more exercise than if you're not doing anything. That's still good. 
type of exercise, whether it's aerobic or muscle strengthening activity. And I would argue that it's important to do the strength, muscle strengthening activity. And if you get stronger by doing muscle strengthening activity, you can actually have more um, muscle capacity to do aerobic exercise. It makes it easier to do aerobic exercise if your muscles are stronger. So these are some tips for getting started. I, I went through these five things, log, move, lift, eat, sleep. And logging is, I think this is actually really important to get a notebook and write down what you did and any symptoms you had. So like if you went on a 10 minute walk and you felt better to, to note that. If you went on a 30 minute walk and you felt totally wiped out, maybe that's too much. And it helps you kind of understand that when you do certain things, what, how are your symptoms? Are they better? Are they worse? And also to keep track of your protein intake and your sleep. Moving is the second part. And, and this is what's good to log what you did. Did you walk? Did you bike? Did you dance? Did you swim? Did you just do some, some exercise snacks and take a five minute walk? Um, any amount of exercise, even five minutes is still beneficial. And if you can't walk, you can exercise in a chair and there are programs for people to exercise in a chair. Um, lifting. And when I say lift, I really just mean strength training. It could be lifting weights, but it could also do, be doing yoga or body weight strength training, or even some of those exercises in the chair, which use your quad muscles and your forearm muscles and your back muscles and your core. Eating protein is important to support muscle growth and proper hydration is important to support your cardiovascular system when you're exercising. And you should sleep as much as you need to feel rested. So for an average adult, that's seven to eight hours. But you know, for some people, they don't need that much sleep. Most people need that much sleep and don't get it. But the other thing is that if you're getting cancer treatment, you also might need nine hours of sleep or 10 hours of sleep. You might need more sleep to, to rest and rest is an important part of physical fitness. So these are the five components of fitness for cancer patients, cardio, strength, balance, stretching, and rest. And you note that I put rest here. Um, rest is actually really important. Um, and yoga, tai chi, and qigong combine multiple components. This is some helpful equipment um, that you can use at home to exercise at home, a good old fashioned yoga mat. Um, there are these adjustable dumbbells that can go from three pounds up to you know, 50 pounds to 60 pounds. Um, these are good um, because you can start small and as you get stronger, you can add more weight. And then there's also something that's, that a lot of trainers like to use with cancer patients, which are resistance bands. So they're not weights. You can't drop them on your foot. There's no way you can really hurt yourself with them, but they're resistance bands to give you some resistance to strengthen your muscles. There's this type of um, exercise prescription called the key three. And these are three exercises that if you don't do anything else with strength training, um, or if you don't know where to get started, these are three moves that use about 80% of the muscles of your body. So one is just a bench press on the floor or on a bed. Um, one is uh, a squat with weights, which if you, you could do it without the wall, or if you need support, you could do it on the wall. Um, and then the, the other one is uh, called a dumbbell row, where you just pull the weight up and this uses your back muscles. So this squat uses your posterior muscles, like your gluteal muscles, your rear end, your hamstrings, your quads. This uses your back. And this uses your chest muscles, your biceps, and your triceps. So it uses a lot of the main muscles of your body. So overcoming barriers, suggestions for, for helping you stick with it. Um, starting with exercise snacks, setting a workday walking routine if you can, finding a partner to, to exercise with you, because sometimes that really helps people stick with it. Exercising at home. Um, using a DVD or an internet-based fitness program. Um, some people do like dancing online or Zumba. Some people just put on some music at their house and dance a little bit. Um, that's fine too. Using tools to measure your steps. If you're a walker, if you're going to use walking as a, as a big part of your fitness program, getting a pedometer and seeing how many steps you're taking, that can see you, that can help you because it can also help you see your progress as you get stronger.
you can work with a professional fitness, a fitness professional, excuse me, um, and join a gym, but that's not necessary because there's a lot of exercise you can do at home and you don't have to spend money to join a gym or get a, a, a personal trainer. The psychology of exercise, I mean, this is a big one. Um, so questions to ask yourself and maybe explore with your healthcare provider are, what do you feel you're doing a good job with concerning exercise? So like maybe you're walking and maybe you're not doing any strength training, but you need to acknowledge the things that you are doing that are good. Um, what activity would you most like to do if you started exercising? Are there barriers to starting exercising? Um, and how could they be overcome? And then asking yourself, can I commit to taking some steps toward becoming more active? Even if it isn't those guidelines I talked about, even could you make a commitment to five minutes a day of something or some exercise snacks every day? And then, you know, strength training, there's options for everybody for strength training and building muscle mass. Um, so you can do body weight exercises. If you're chair bound, you could do strength training in the chair or, or chair yoga. Um, there's yoga, Pilates, Qigong, Tai Chi, and then there's weightlifting basics. And, it, and the key three that I, that I have in the handout um, is an easy way to use 80% of your major muscle groups. That's an easy way to get started um, for patients if you don't know how to lift weights or you haven't done that before. And then these are my parting reflections before we stop and start the question and answer session. Um, never do nothing. Change the way you look at exercise. Um, and I really feel like any exercise is better than none. And I just encourage you to try even a little bit and not to get discouraged if you can't do the full 30 minutes or the full amount. A little exercise goes a long way and it adds through the day. So if you can't take a 30 minute walk, but you could take two 15 minute walks, that's still 30 minutes a day, that still counts. Um, exercise helps independent of weight loss or body mass index. So it's not what you look like. It's not whether you lose weight or not. Increasing muscle mass and fighting sarcopenia or low muscle mass, it increases the relative strength of your muscles for aerobic activity, and it's best accomplished through strength and resistance training. Um, exercise for cancer can help with prevention, recovery of function, and risk of recurrence reduction. So this is a website that I have in your in your handouts. This is an exercise prescription you can bring to your doctor. You can print it out and bring it to your doctor and ask your doctor what they think is safe for you. These are my weightlifting, weightlifting and exercising photographs. And then these are some resources. There's a very good website from the American College of Sports Medicine called Moving Through Cancer. Here's some helpful links to that website. And these are some other helpful resources. And I wanna give a special thanks to Catherine Schmitz, who's a, a personal friend, but she's also, she's somebody who's, who's fought really hard to get exercise um, studied and in the mainstream for cancer patients to help them with side effects. A lot of the um, work that was done that showed all the benefits of exercise came from Catherine Schmidt. And she has this book that I feel is really helpful for patients and caregivers um, called Moving Through Cancer. And it has like a lot of um, tips for helping people start exercising, stay with it. And I think I'll stop there and we'll take some questions. Oh, thank you so much, Dr. Marshall. I'm sure there'd be a loud round of applause from the audience if we could uh, do that over Zoom. Um, really practical, really meaningful. So appreciate that. Um, we have fabulous questions already in the Q&A, and um, I'm sure others may come in, so I'll, I'll jump into it. So uh, Zana in the audience asks about cancer-related fatigue, and that was right after you showed the slide, but I think it's a good reminder. She asked, is cancer-related fatigue caused by the side effects of cancer treatments or the cancer itself? And I'll just add to the broader question of when folks feel fatigue, how can they think about, you know, starting programs? And, and you've talked a lot about that, but sort of uh, touch on that again, because it comes up so often. Yeah. Cancer related fatigue is very complex. It's probably caused mostly by the treatment if the patient doesn't have metastatic disease. 
So let's say I have a breast cancer and, and it hasn't spread into my body where you can see it on a scan and I'm getting curative treatment. Most likely my cancer related fatigue is from the treatment and it's from the inflammation that's caused by the treatment. Um, exercise can help decrease that fatigue. And it's very helpful if you start exercising right when you start treatment, it can actually keep it from getting too bad. But if you didn't know that and you have had your treatment and you're still suffering from fatigue, it, to start exercising can really help. Now, if you have metastatic cancer where it's spread into the body and you're being treated for controlling the cancer, that's the goal of the treatment, you probably have cancer related fatigue, mostly related to the treatment, but it can also be related to the cancer as well. And even in that case, exercise does help that too. Um, so to Kavita's question about how do you get started if you're so fatigued, just start really small, like start off maybe doing some chair exercises or chair squats or just a five minute walk just try to do something every day. And maybe if a five minute walk gets easier, you could do a five minute walk twice a day, or you can do a 10 minute walk, but just gently increase your activity as much as you can. That's great. And I think your point you made about logging, you know, how does a 10 minute walk feel versus how does a 20 minute walk feel that can be really helpful for patients. Oh, um, there is something called the 10 minute rule. And that is, um, if you do an activity for 10 minutes and you feel better, then you can keep going. If you feel bad after 10 minutes, like you're doing it for 10 minutes and you're waiting for that good feeling and it's not coming, maybe that's a day where you stop and you just, you back off. You have to listen to your body. Super helpful. Um, okay, and then she also asked, how can the tumor micro environment be improved in breast cancer if the breast tissue is made up of fat? So um, this is very interesting. So exercise um, recruits uh, immune cells into the, into the actual tumor. They've done studies which were really interesting where they biopsied a patient's tumor, they randomized them to just maybe some deep breathing meditation or exercise of 30 minutes a day and then at surgery, they looked at the tumor and the micro environment of the tumor was dramatically different uh, in the patients that walk 30 minutes a day because it recruited immune cells into the area of the tumor. And it turned on a lot of genes that lowered a lot of those bad chemicals. So it's really not the fat in the local area that's the problem. It's the fat of like the body, the whole body that it, it can make those chemicals that circulate. And that's why doing something like exercise, which helps the whole body um, and recruits the immune system, it can go to a specific place and help, but it's, it's actually a, a total body effect. And the muscles be, get, being larger and more muscle mass, making those good chemicals that interfere with that crosstalk of the, of the fat cells from the whole body that's, it's a really complicated system, but um, exercise helps you locally, but it helps the whole system too. That, I think that makes a lot of sense. Um, and yeah, hopefully Zana, you can ask more if you have further questions about that, but yeah, that makes a lot of sense. Um, Lindsay asks, how do you suggest cancer centers uh, suggest or prescribe exercise to patients at diagnosis during and after? Um, patients don't often have the energy to uh, or inclination to begin exercise when they're so overwhelmed or feeling terrible. Right. This is this is actually a very important point, and it's a problem that we don't have a solution for yet. Um, there's a lot of places that are studying exercise in the cancer center. They have like exercise oncology specialists that when a person's starting treatment, they engage them to start exercising to help prevent side effects. Um, there's also exercise oncology professionals where you can be referred to after your treatment to help you recover. It's, there's, they're called um, 
oncology rehab or oncology exercise oncology. Um, I really feel like we should have exercise oncology that's available to everyone that's paid for by insurance that could um, support patients at the beginning of their journey with cancer and through their journey and after their journey and in survivorship. And that's the goal of many exercise oncology experts in the United States and national and internationally to try to make it a standard of care. But at the moment, it's not a standard of care where it's paid for by insurance or, you know, sometimes it can be paid for by physical therapy. But I feel like it's a really important thing and we don't have a solution yet of how to deliver it to patients. So I think educating patients about it's important um, and maybe educating advocates that can advocate for patients too. I couldn't agree more. I think it should be part of what we help patients with from the start. Um, another question, would you recommend going to the gym for strength training during chemo when the risk of infections is high? I would recommend that you do strength training either with a physical therapist, you could get referred by your, um, your doctor or doing yoga. I think yoga is a really great, gentle way to do strength training. You can get a lot of benefit from doing yoga at home um, or Tai Chi or Qigong without having to go to a gym where you're inside with people um, touching a lot of things, which makes people scared. And also there's germs everywhere. Um, I really feel like doing something like that to increase strength or if you have the means, which not everybody does, to maybe work with a personal trainer twice a week and then they could teach you what you could do at home on your own, like with resistance bands or, or small weights. Um, we actually have an exercise oncology program at UCSF that helps people design something they can do at home so they can be doing it during treatment but not have to be going somewhere. Um, and I think a lot, of, a lot of big centers are starting to think about doing that to help people exercise during treatment because it helps with side effects so much. Agreed. And that's right. Um, UCSF has exercise counselors that you can work with. Um, so certainly, and we'll put that into the information that's on the online resources. Um, so Claire had asked actually the question that I was thinking of um, that you touched on. What exercise benefits are covered by insurance companies? If a cancer physician were to prescribe exercise, to what degree would necessary equipment like weights, classes, or gym membership be supported? If not, how can physicians help to advocate for inclusion of these benefits um, so that patients with reduced access to resources can still benefit? So there's a, there's a thing that's in my resources. It's called Live Strong, and it's through the YMCA. And they do have a um, strength training and exercise program for cancer patients that's in the past, at least, has been free, um, reduced cost or free. Um, like UCSF um, has the exercise counselors, that's free to patients. Um, there are gyms that if you're a cancer patient will give you a discounted membership. And not all gyms do that, but th there are many gyms that do that. Um, but I think really what has to happen is that the benefits are so overwhelming that I think we have to advocate for exercise oncology to be covered at a national level um, where they're in, it's in the guidelines. So insurance will have to pay for it. I mean, I think that's really what has to happen to give everybody access. Uh, but in the meantime, uh, exercise through physical therapy is covered by insurance. So if you get a physical therapy referral, you can, that can be covered through insurance. And if you're at an institution where they have exercise oncology, that's usually subsidized by the institution to pay the trainers to help work with the patients. Steven asks, I'm generally motivated by quick results. Is there an activity you would recommend that would provide me with measurable early results? I guess it depends on your goal. So like if your goal was to increase your aerobic capacity, probably doing more intense aerobic activity. Um, like if you had anxiety or depression or 
really bad fatigue and you could do more aerobic activity like you're able to, that might give you faster results with those types of things and with sleep. Um, as far as strength training goes, strength training is something that you have to kind of commit to it over time. It's not something that changes really fast, but there's measurable changes in body composition, usually after 12 weeks of strength training. Um, but I don't, I think it depends on your goals. He and I think that his goal is definitely muscle gain. Muscle gain. Okay, gotcha. So in muscle gain, you should probably try to do strength training like three days a week if you want to really gain muscle mass. But if you're not strong enough or you're not, uh, are you too fatigued? You could do it two days a week. We also, and I'm, I'm, this is in my slide, but I didn't say it specifically. We recommend when you're doing strength training, not to do it consecutively, like not to do three days in a row and then take four days off. You need to rest in between to have hypertrophy and muscle growth. Um, but probably three days a week of strength training, trying to hit the major muscle groups, the back, the front, the quads, the posterior chain, and there's a, a hinging, hinging motion, like a deadlift and then a squat. There's like different ways in which you can do like four simple types of exercise for the major muscle groups, doing it three days a week and increasing resistance as you get stronger, you'll, you'll gain muscle mass. Usually within 12 weeks, you'll see a noticeable difference. Thank you. Perfect. Um, uh, the next question, if one just has strength, to do only Qigong for about 30 to 40 minutes per day, but no other activity, is that enough? Qigong, I would consider very valuable. Um, I would try to add a little bit of walking maybe, like maybe like adding a little bit of walking several times a week or maybe a little tiny bit of walking because what Qigong isn't is it's not aerobic. And so if you want to get those benefits for decreasing cancer-related fatigue, anxiety, sleep, those types of benefits, probably adding in a little bit of walking. And you could start really little. You could start with five minutes a day or 10 minutes a day. And then you'll notice that you feel more energy. And then you might be able to do more walking. Or maybe you, do, you, you don't do Qigong twice a week and you go for a walk if it's too much for your body. But you, you really have to listen to yourself. And if you're doing 30 to 40 minutes of Qigong, that's really good if you're feeling really super tired. So you should just congratulate yourself for that. But the what you could do if you want to add something more is just a little tiny bit of a brisk walking where you can talk, but you can't sing. I love that point that you just made also to listen to your body. Um, really important. And yes, congratulate yourself for what you are doing. Um, Patricia asks, I asked for a referral to PT post-surgery and during my chemo treatment, it was very helpful for me. Um, so Patricia, thank you for that comment. Sounds like she was able to get into physical therapy and that's uh, physical therapy, exercise oncology. These are really important resources. Um, uh, Tracy asks, uh, do you have any recommendations, exercise resources for children or uh, young adults with cancer? Um, as a peds oncologist, I always discuss the importance of exercise and its benefits. Kids naturally want to play and be active, which is great. Um, although young adults population can be tough. Um, understanding benefits of physical activity in this population is something we are starting to study and just so important. Agree. So do you have any recommendations or resources for that age group? You know, the young adults, I would actually, I would actually say that probably the strength training part is really important and just moderate aerobic activity um, because they've had oftentimes mm, treatments that, and I'm not a pediatric oncologist, I'm a breast cancer adult oncologist, so you could probably really correct me on this, but um, I feel like they've had treatments that could really affect their cardiovascular system. And one of the things that we know in mature adults is that cardiovascular exercise can actually help protect the heart or help the heart recuperate really from treatments like with anthracyclines, um, especially if done with, with the treatment or like right after the treatment. Um, but strength training is important for young adults because 
strength training helps with body composition. And I think one of the things that I've heard from um, a pediatric group that I was working with to, to try to design a strength training program from was that they have body image, body image problems sometimes, or, you know, they feel uh, that, 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 that strength training might be helpful in helping them build confidence again. I guess that's what I, what I've been told, but I would love, if you're interested, you can contact me offline. I'd be, love to talk to you about that because we're actually working with a pediatrics group to try to develop a strength training program for them. Perfect. That's great. Thank you, Dr. Marshall. Um, would the exercise program be different for a patient with prostate cancer compared to a patient with colon cancer? So the actual guidelines are not different. The, the 150 minutes a week plus two, two episodes of strength training a week, but colorectal cancer patients might have some pelvic floor problems from treatment if they got radiation, say, to their pelvis. And so some of the strength training exercises, excuse me, the strength training exercises that we focus on sometimes will help with strengthening the pelvic floor. Um, the same with prostate cancer patients, they sometimes would have maybe some pelvic abnormalities from getting radiation sometimes or surgery. And so sometimes we would do some specific treatments to help with strengthening the muscles of the pelvic floor for them as well. Uh, if a person didn't have pelvic cancer or pelvic radiation, we, we wouldn't have any necessarily special exercises for them. For a breast cancer patient, we might have a different program where we're fo focusing on the range of motion of the shoulder related to the surgery that was up in this area. So different tumors might have something that's specific for them, but the general guidelines of 150 minutes a week plus strength training twice a week would be the same. It's just you might like add some extra credit in there to help them. And then just to add on to that, as you were saying earlier, you know, listen to your body. And so folks at different stages um, in terms of the type of disease you have or the stage of disease, and then also are you... Um, during chemotherapy, during radiation, during surgery, that may adjust what your body is wanting, capable to do, but just being um, cognizant of that in terms of the guidelines as well. Well, one thing I'll add about the prostate cancer is breast cancer and prostate cancer both uh, take, sometimes have to take hormone blockers, and that can reduce muscle mass in women and men. So that actually makes the strength training portion of exercise more important for a prostate patient or a breast cancer patient that's on hormone blockade. Perfect. Thank you. Um, Stephen asks, can you talk about UCSF's core and more class, which is available free to cancer patients, regardless of where they are being treated? You know, I haven't seen that one, so I need to look it up, but thanks for letting me know about it. <laughs> um, I can, I can, I haven't taken the class myself, but um, I believe it's through uh, exercise oncology. Exercise oncology at UCSF has some classes that they offer cancer patients, and then the Osher Center for Integrative Health at UCSF also has classes um, that they offer. And so, uh, these are all different resources that you can get to at the UCSF Health website or the Osher Center website. Um, but yes, they are free for cancer patients. So um, if you're interested please do look them up and we'll have, we'll, we'll make sure to put that into the resources online. Um, uh, Julia asks, oh, Julia says, Corin Moore is through the Osher Center. Great class on Friday mornings. I go every week. Okay, perfect. Okay, Thank awesome. Thank you, Julia. I should try it out. <laughs> <laughs> um, perfect. And uh, you, Tracy says, yes, she will reach out. And Stephen says, um, wonderful, thank you so much. I'm going to ask one other question that I know has come up in our last session, um, and then we'll come to a close. Um, intermittent fasting. This is a topic that many people are interested in. You, you say a few words on that from your perspective. Sure. So intermittent fasting is a, a big thing in the fitness industry right now. And it also has been studied in different populations of patients, in obese patients, in regular patients, in athletes, 
it's been studied in um, cancer patients. Um, it's also been studied in uh, people that have diabetes or the metabolic syndrome. And maybe what, um, Dr. Marshall, just say a word for those who don't know what it is. Yeah. So what it what it is is um, going for a period of time without eating which can be different lengths depending on what type of program it is. So it could be as small of amount as 12 hours overnight where you stop eating dinner at seven and you don't eat till seven the next morning. You just don't have midnight snacks. Um, it could be a 10, 14 where you, where you uh, fast for 14 hours overnight and then you eat in a 10 hour window. Or it could be something that they call 16-8, where you fast for 16 hours overnight and you eat in an eight-hour window. It's also called time-restricted feeding. And what, um, what they've shown in multiple studies in multiple different ways of fasting is that it can lower some of the chemicals in the blood, like insulin, inflammation, what they call C-reactive protein. So different chemicals in the blood, some of which are engaged with cancer. So, you know, from a cancer perspective, we're interested in them for, can they lower the risk of cancer by lowering these chemicals um, and then affecting the microenvironment of the tumor like we talked about earlier. Um, in breast cancer patients who fast overnight 12 to 13 hours, there's a lower risk of recurrence of breast cancer. So that's something that, that a study showed. Um, the, the problem with fasting is that some patients feel bad when they fast and some patients, especially if they're already underweight or have low body weight, it's not really safe for them to fast because we don't want them to lose more weight and get weaker. Um, so fasting can affect people really differently. Some people feel terrible and they feel what they call hangry, which is that they're hungry and angry at the same time. Um, whereas some people can go for 16 hours without eating and they're perfectly fine. The one thing that they've shown in normal people is that if you do 16, eight fasting and you're not doing any kind of exercise or strength training, you actually lose weight, but you lose, you lose muscle mass. So I don't recommend like extreme fasting to my patients because I don't want them to lose muscle mass. I want them to keep their muscle and build muscle. But I do recommend to my breast cancer patients to fast overnight for 12 to 13 hours if it doesn't make them feel bad, because that's a very mild form of fasting. Um, the other thing is that there's something called the fasting mimicking diet, and they're studying the fasting mimicking diet in patients that are on chemotherapy to see if it helps to protect the normal cells and kill the cancer cells better. There's some animal data about that, but it's not ready for prime time in patients. And I wouldn't recommend doing that without the supervision of your doctor because you could lose too much weight or you could feel bad or it can make you have low blood pressure. So you have to be careful if you're gonna to try to do any kind of fasting. And I would get the approval of your doctor before trying fasting if you haven't done it before because we don't want people to get uh, weak or lose too much weight or, or faint you know, get low blood pressure and faint and fall or something like that. Perfect. Well, we are out of time. This was so meaningful and insightful. Thank you so much, Dr. Marshall. Mm -hmm.